budget in our standard theory seminar today. Uh, I'll try this again. Uh, we have uh, Georges P Pioris. That's right. Oh, okay, good. Uh, who uh, did his PhD at Cornell with a retarded and is currently a postdoc with uh, Jeff Schmaya at Georgia Tech and Hei Yan at Oxford. Yes. Um, and he will talk today about minimally invasive mechanisms ruling with carefully chosen advice. And and I'll just mention, George, this is going to be uh, here all week, well, I think through Thursday, so yes. in, in our postdoc office, so come visit, say hello. Thank you. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, first of all, thanks for being patient. And, uh, I'm, uh, I'm very happy to be here and entertain you like, during your lunch. And today, uh, I'll be talking about ruling with carefully chosen advice. And really, what we'll be trying to understand is like, under what kind of circumstances can a, like a centralized authority help a number, a number of self interest agents to actually solve a hard, distributed task. Okay? And this is a joint work with uh, Nina Balkan, Sarah Kerbel, and Zin Wusin, also at Georgia Tech. So, Let's start off with an example of a hard distributed task. Okay, so here's a map of the United States, and we have like a set of highways. Now, each highway, let's say, it has a specific cost of operation. Let's say it's a it's a WS per state that it actually tra tra traverses. Okay. So now each individual state has a decision to make. Okay, it can either create a toll service and actually uh, at a specific cost that might depend on the identity of the state, and since provide services essentially cover all the highways that, that go through it, okay? essentially build like a service center, or decide to do nothing, at which case it actually has to pay for taking care of the highways that pass through it, and they're not covered by any other state. Okay? Now, it's uh, relatively straightforward to see that, let's say, if, the, if these costs are, are small, then, let's say, stable outcomes for this game correspond to, like, uh, coverings. That is, every single highway must have at least, like, one state that actually serves it. So, finding the optimal solution for such a problem uh, essentially generalizes the set cover problems and such a problem is going to be hard, even from a centralized perspective, okay? Now, let's assume, let's take a step back, and let's assume that a centralized authority like the US government wants to intervene and try to help the individual states make the correct decision, like come up with a solution that's actually good. Now, both in theory and in practice, there are different approaches that one can take that have uh, different pluses or minus, minuses, and we will shortly uh, we will go through uh, these approaches like next, okay? So the first like standard approach is that of like centralized optimization, which as I also say can be thought of as the perspective of a benevolent dictator. So here, like the U.S. government essentially hijacks all the decisions and makes the decisions for all individual state, okay? And of course the advan the advantages of such an approach is that it's as fast and as efficient as possible, okay? For example, like for covering games, we know that there exists like good cost and time, uh, cost and approximation algorithms that run in polynomial time. Unfortunately, at the same time, this kind of, that's kind of, these kind of solutions are not very like meaningful in many practical instances because, for example, they're extremely unfair. So the winners and losers they are handpicked by the center. And for example, if we go back to the specific example of the U.S. government, for example, such a practice could be just unconstitutional. Okay. And furthermore, of course, uh, implementing these kind of solutions requires intimate knowledge of like local information, and this might be hard to acquire, especially since individuals have an incentive to misreport. Okay. Now, in order to like circumvent many of these uh, difficulties, like mechanism design was introduced, in, in which case essentially we're trying to uh, guide in a very sort of like heavy-handed way, the behavior of the agents, okay? So again, here, as I say, in these settings, you're free to do as you're told. So here, the center radically redesigns 
the incentives of the agents by, let's say, imposing payments, either, let's say, positive or negative uh, side payments, such that compliance is guaranteed, okay? And this kind of approach was introduced in a very similar paper by Nissan and Ronan, and, and the goals of this kind of line of research is to understand how close can we get to the optimal of, of, uh, central, of the centralized approach, okay? But again, uh, if we think of like real practical like examples, making these startup solutions are in some sense are hard to implement. Because for example, using uh, positive incentives uh, is non-trivial because somebody needs to infuse this money into the market, whereas negative incentives like let's say taxations are unpopular in practice. Okay. So support for these kind of measures cannot be taken for granted. And it's something, you know, this kind of approach should only be used as a last measure of defense okay, against very hard decentralized problems. Okay? And there are even more other intangibles that, that make the problem trickier. For example, let's say somebody in this room comes up with a radical new mechanism. Well, maybe, you know, people are very much used to with a current set of uh, approaches. So it's not easy to apply it in practice. So because of uh, this kind of issues, there's been a recent trend in terms of trying to analyze uh, like simpler mechanisms that also work in practice. And the notion of, of simple is actually is a bit complicated. You've got to be simple in many different, uh, along many different like axes. For example, uh, there's been a recent work in terms of like trying to understand the, the limits that we can achieve with second price options, even when we use non-monopoly reserve prices. And there's also been like a uh, explicit, like uh, line of research that try to understand what can be achieved without actually using money explicitly. Okay, so mechanism without money. Now, if we take this kind of simplicity approach, it's very extreme. This actually corresponds to essentially just like doing nothing. So this this uh, set of agents they have their own incentives. Well, just like step back and let do what they do best. Let's say the market will essentially come up with a solution for this problem. Okay. Now, so hopefully here the dynamics of the system will converge to a good equilibrium. Okay. And again, this line of research was introduced at, at the same time, like 99, by another very influential paper by Kuchipes Papadimitriou, where they coined up the notion of like price of anarchy as the ratio between uh, the cost of the worst equilibrium and the cost of the opt. Now, intuitively, if this ratio is uh, a small constant, then we're good to go. Like, uh, unfortunately, uh, for many examples of games, <laughs> these ratios can be very, very bad. Okay? So, here, uh, again, there's been a, lot of la like a, la a long line of research in terms of like, trying to understand whether learning can actually like, do something smarter than just converging to an arbitrary equilibrium. So maybe by equilibrium selection, we can actually converge to, let's say, the best possible equilibrium, fast, okay? But in the kind of games that we just, in the kind of like example we introduced in the very first slide, this kind of approach cannot work, right? Because, uh, because for these kind of instances, finding the best, let's say, mass equilibrium is hard, even from a centralized perspective, okay? So here we'll be focusing on this kind of like very hard problems. So hard problems that are hard both from a price of energy perspective and from a complexity perspective. Okay. And the idea here is that okay, we have these self interest agents that they will be using selfish behavior in terms of like pursuing their own incentives, but at the same time, what can a what can the center uh, achieve in terms of helping them converge to good solutions fast? while having little or no enforcing power over them, okay? For example, without using any money. And of course, the problem is, is rather simple if we have full enforcing power. In that case, all we have to do is, let's say, just broadcast the best NASA equilibrium to the agents. The agents will just, like, let's say, blindly follow it, and we can get as close to the optimal solution as the price of stability, okay? Uh, of course, this is a rather unrealistic guarantee, okay? So here, we'll only be asking something like much weaker from the system. So we'll, trying to, we'll be asking essentially, okay, what happens 
if only a constant fraction of the system is affected. So if only a constant fraction of the agents is actually like willing to like, receive this advice, can we actually get good? Can we actually get close to the centralized optimum? So can we actually get close to, let's say, the, the price of stability? So essentially, we'll try to understand which problems are amenable to this kind of treatment. And the reason why this, uh, this question is, is uh, interesting is that, well, for this kind of problems, well, we don't have to actually uh, come up with complicated mechanisms that, let's say, require payments or require, like, uh, complicated communication between the agents. Well, here, just having this, like, center broadcasting central advice is enough to get fast to almost optimal output. Okay? And a question that's very closely related with this line of work is, of course, what makes for good advice? So suppose, let's say that, you know, you're the president of a company, and you're actually going to give suggestions about, like, to, let's say, to your employees about what to do. And you know that only a small fraction of the employees will actually, like, change their behavior based on, on what you actually uh, propose. Like, really, what you want to, what you want to make sure is that you know, your advice does not come to, let's say, have an adverse effect, like a hidden adverse effect. So only a few, and actually you want exactly the opposite. You want that even, despite the fact that this advice has been, which is a very small number of people, it actually has a huge impact over the whole state of the system, okay? This is a non-trivial question, it's, it's not obvious that this thing should even be possible, okay? And, here, exactly, we'll try to understand uh, what are the limitations of this kind of approaches, and I like to see it as some sort of like the computational theory of like how to do math. Okay. Now, for the rest of this talk, I will formally describe our setting, that is, like the games that we will be interested in, and next, I'll essentially describe our model, that is, like how does the advertising center works, and in what sense, uh, the, how can it affect the behavior of the individual agents. And next I'll be discussing, you know, what are major results, and I'll give some intuition behind the proofs. And finally we'll be ending with some open questions. And, uh, and speaking of which, like, of course you're, feel free to ask questions at any point, including right now. Alright, so, as our initial example has hinted, so we'll be focusing on uh, set covering games. So again, like if we, right, let me just remind you these examples. So we have the set of highways and the set of states that can service them. And now essentially every single highway can be seen as a set, okay? A set that needs to be covered. And now the states, the individual states, they correspond to nodes here in our, in our set covering instance. And specifically, we have that each such node, each such state, is an agent. It's a selfish agent with two possible strategies, either being on or being off. For being on, essentially, what it encodes is that you're being, becoming part of the cover. Okay? So if I let me just remind you that if you decide to be on, then you have a, if you decide to be a service provider, then you have an individual cost that essentially just depends on your identity. Whereas, if you're off, then you actually have to pay a cost which is equal to the sum of the weights of all the uncovered sets in which you belong to. What okay. the interpretation in the highway example? So, the interpretation in the highway is that, as I said, like, a state can become, uh, can create a toll service, okay? Essentially, you, you can, like, you, might, you can create, like, a specific, like, uh, you can hire a specific number of people, and these people will take care of like the roads so that, that pass through the state. To the on that corresponds. Yeah, that corresponds to the on strategy. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the off strategy, if there if there are states, <coughs> if essentially there are roads that actually pass through you, but they're not covered, then essentially you have to pay this WS cost, which is the cost of taking care of this road per state that it traverses. So essentially the there always, there's always some way that 
I, either there's a total service that takes care of a, a specific road, or this, or the total cost of taking care of a road is equal to uh, is taken care of by all the states that this road tra traverses. Does every state pay WS? It does not cover. Yes. So the cost here, the, so the cost for a specific set would correspond to S size of S times WS. It has this interpretation precisely. But really, like the way you should be thinking about it is that that this is like any sort of like set covering problem can be essentially interpreted by such a distributed setting, right? So this is a specific example, but in any sort of like optimization problem where set covering instances arise, you can define such a strategy, right? So this is the, the cost of, for, so in, in the classical like set covering problems, let, let's say unweighted set covering problems, what you have is that you have the CIs that are small, let's say CIs are all equal and they're less than one, and all the WS are equal to one, okay? And in such case, then, it's always in your best interest to be on, even if you're part of a single uncovered set, okay? And uh, now for the, for the purpose of this talk, uh, we'll, we'll also be making the assumptions that uh, so the maximum size of each set is a constant, and the maximum, and so we're looking at a restricted set of set covering games, and also the maximum number of sets that the pair of nodes can belong to is also a constant, and we'll be assuming that these two quantities are also like bounded. And in the actual paper, we actually have explicit descriptions of how these uh, uh, terms like affect our ratios, but for the, for the discussion, it would be easier to assume to make this. Uh, Simplifying assumptions in terms of describing our results, but even this uh, restricted class of games, it's actually rather general. For example, as a very special case, it actually encodes all uh, vertex covering games because a vertex cover is just a, a set cover where the size of its set is equal to two. Okay, and so these are just lines, and these are just edges between any two vertices. <coughs> And, but even this uh, simple example of games, the actual trash of anarchy can be as, as bad as one can fear, okay? Because if we look at this example of the star network, then there are two possible like uh, coverings, like maximal coverings. The optimal one where only the center is on and everybody else is off, and the complement of this. And it's easy for, to verify, as I said, that Let's say when the costs are, let's say when the CI is a half for its node and the weight of its edge is equal to one, it's easy to verify that both of these configurations are Nash equilibrium. What right. does those over up there? It's just the, the sum of just the sum of the costs. Sum of CI? The sum of, so the cost of an agent depends on the strategy. So at any individual at any so sort of like outcome, the social cost is just the sum of the cost of all the, of, of all the agents. This is the, the standard definition. So, for example, the social cost here uh, would just be, I mean, here would be order of n, like, or here it would be just order of 1, because here there are no uncovered, in both of these configurations, there are no uncovered elements, right? So, the only ways that, that cost uh, become part of the picture, they become part of the picture as, as this, from the CIs. So for example, if all the CIs are assumed to be equal, then this gives an immediate ratio of like n minus one. All right, and uh, although this game has a high price of anarchy, it has some other positive characteristics that we'll be taking advantage of during the proof. Specifically, these games are potential games, and specifically uh, what this means is that there's a potential function, that's a, there's a global function that actually captures the the incentives of every individual agent when this this agent like moves unilaterally, okay? So this actually captures the difference in the utilities of all the agents when it's agent, when it's when a specific agent moves. Now this these uh, games have very nice characteristics, and uh, among the more desirable of them is that pure Nash equilibria always exist, and best response path always converges to them. And this is trivial because 
along the best response path, the potential is always decreasing, and this cannot uh, go on forever. Okay? And furthermore, if we look at the potential for these games and its social cost, then we see that there's an interesting relationship between the groups. <coughs> so the social cost, that's like the sum of the cost of all agents, is bounded <coughs> above and below by the potential times some constant. Okay? And this suffices to show that the price of stability for these games is also a constant. That is that there's exist there exist mass equilibria that are like almost optimal. Okay? So our goal would be to be competitive with them. With the optimal mass equilibria. I'm sorry, uh, that last the max x equals constant that comes from your assumption that this is right. That's right. So now we'll be focusing. Uh, now we'll be introducing these, our two models: uh, the public service advertising one and the limited side that they're actually initially proposed in different papers, but we'll be analyzing both of them uh, for this uh, class of games. Okay. So uh, the public service advertising actually tries to capture what happens in the case of uh, uh, where somebody uses an actual an actual advertising campaign. So initially, the agents, they're, some, they're some, in some arbitrary state, and now they receive some information about what they should do in the, in the form of some sort of like joint action profile. Okay? Now, each agent essentially tosses a random coin, and with some small constant probability alpha, he decides to follow the advice. Okay? You, you become affected by the signal that you receive. And these agents, we call them receptive. Okay? So now there are two phases in our protocol. Initially, well, you look at all the non-receptive agents, and we assume that these guys, they just fall to some arbitrary equilibrium for themselves, given the fixed behavior of the receptive agents. This is always possible, because, for example, the non-receptive agents can just best respond okay, in this potential game. In the second phase, the campaign actually wears off, and everybody best response to you actually reach an asset Okay. So to ask the, the public service to, to advise every single agent in the system what to do? Every single agent is receives a we receive an action to follow, but it's not necessarily <coughs> So let me give it a, a concrete example, okay, for our set of games. So here's a specific uh, configuration of a uh, of a vertex covering game, let's say there's seven nodes, seven agents with this guy corresponding to the center. And now, let's say that the center broadcasts this advice. Everybody receives an action that they should follow. Now, these respective agents, they, they toss the random coins, and two of them, you know, they decide, okay, I'm gonna follow the advice. What this means is that for this center player, it is that he's gonna switch <coughs> from being off to being on, okay? Now, the non-receptive agents, which are these five, they're just uh, going to get a chance like, to best respond and reach an asset equilibrium, in which case the only guy that has incentive to change his strategy is this guy. Because there's no reason for him to be on and, and pay since his, head, since his head is already covered. Right? Now, in the final step, the advertisement wears off, everybody sort of like forgets what they've received, and again, everybody's given the opportunity to, to play again. And in this very simple example, again, the only guy that has an incentive to change is this guy, because he's a, his single edge is covered. And in this very simple example, you, you convert to what's the optimal, the optimal solution for this problem. But ideally, we want to be able to say that something like this happens in all, in all games. I'm sorry, but if the cost of being on was very high, wouldn't the middle guy have uh, best responded by switching off. Yes, but here we're trying. So I'm trying to capture the intuition of uh, the set covering solutions, where mm -hmm. the cost of being on is is small, smaller. But our results actually hold regardless. Okay. Now, in our second model, uh, this is the learn then decide model. So again, we assume that we have an arbitrary configuration. And we have a, a public, uh, we have a center that can broadcast information, but now no one takes this information like for granted, like not even a single agent. But 
In contrast, now every single agent is willing to explore this advice. So with some small probability, he actually plays the proposed action, otherwise he just do what best for him. Okay? And in the second phase, everybody in random order either commits to playing the proposed action or always playing best response. So what this, this model tries to capture is, is this two like phase exploration exploitation kind of like behavior. So first of all, we're trying to understand how good, how, you know, whether actually following this advice is in your best behavior or not, and then you actually get to commit to a specific action. Okay. And now we'll be trying to, okay, now I'm going to describe our results okay, about uh, this kind of games. And we'll start with results for generic advice. And what I mean by this is that uh, the only fact that we'll be using in these uh, results about the broadcasted action vector is its cost, okay? And specifically in vertex cover games, we actually get what we desire, that, that as long as the broadcasted center uh, uh, give some sort of like good advice, broadcast good advice, then within polynomial time, the dynamics converge to a state whose expected cost is of the same order as the advertised vector. Okay? So, unfortunately, in the case of uh, set cover games, we actually get, a, get something worse. We get a, a, a quadratic term here. Okay? So, ideally, like we would like, I mean, this kind of result is, is useful only when the on the optimal uh, solution or the, the optimal solution which we can approximate uh, is, is, is small. Okay? But what happens when the optimal solution is large? Then we want to be able to circumvent this, uh, uh, this, this, this bad quadratic term. And what we can show is we can actually do that by relying on advice vectors that have extra special structure. Okay? So we can show that we can infuse specific combinatorial structures in the kind of like uh, uh, strategy outcome that we broadcast such that with high probability we converge to states in polynomial time, we converge to states whose, whose cost is of the same order as the advertised solution. And furthermore, in the case of uh, these uh, uh, set cover problems, we can find such uh, advice with this tailored structure that approximate the optimal solution up to a multiplicative logarithmic term. Okay? So we see that that it's not necessarily it's not just the actual the, it's not just the quality of the advice that has an effect on the performance of these dynamics. It's actually more it, it's it's more sensitive to internal characteristics. And I think actually this question and how it is, let's say, how these internal characteristics that vary from like game to game, I think this is a very interesting question to, to ponder about. But, but let me, let me, okay, so now from this point on, I'll try to give some sort of like intuition about how, how one would go to, in terms of like proving this kind of result. Okay. In the case of like the cost, can you? Uh, please, please, go. Yeah, in the case of the cost of the optimalist constant, this, because we have like, well, in the case of the cost of the optimal is constant, then all, all you have to do is like, you, you go back to this result, right? Yeah. So, right. uh, yeah, so we'll start off with the first model, model, the public service advertising, and again, I remind you these two phases. First, you have a, a small number of receptive agents, and everybody else reaches a nice equilibrium, given what they're doing. In the second phase, everybody best responds, okay? And this advice is, is, uh, is forgotten, right? So there are these two phases, and I denote by S prime and S double prime to be the outcomes at the end of the first and second phase respectively, okay? Now really what I want, I want, to, I want to upper bound the cost of S double prime, because that's the cost at the very end of our whole mechanism, okay? But I, I want to start by saying that it suffices to actually bound the cost of the, at the end of the first phase. And why is that the case? Well, in the second phase, everybody best responds, so the potential can only be decreasing during that phase, right? But I've already argued that the social cost is actually upper bounded by the potential times a constant. 
Okay. So in the second phase, the social cost can only increase by this constant multiplicative factor. So as long as I can upper bound the cost at the end of the first phase, essentially I'm done. So, okay. So remember, again, now, I want to compare the cost of at the end of the first phase with the cost of the advertised vector. And I want to show them that they're essentially the same, okay? But now, how can, in what ways can this vector, can this outcome be more expensive? Well, there, there are two ways that you can incur extra cost. Either there are some new uncovered sets that used to be covered in the advertised solution and I'm being penalized because of them, or there are some new agents that are currently on that used to be off, and each of them pays a, an extra cost. And as long as I can bound each of them by, let's say, something that's a constant times the cost of the advertised solution, then the rest of the terms, you know, they're already upper bounded by the cost of the uh, advice vector, and I'm done. Okay, so I need to prove these two lemmas. Now, the first lemma is actually going to be uh, the more straightforward one. And from this point on, you know, I'll try to give some pictorial explanation behind these proofs. And in order to do so, I'll use the following sort of like, kind of like notation. So, the size of a specific uh, node will actually encode uh, what is its strategy in the advertised solution. So, if your node is large, it means that it should be on. If it's small, like the advertise suggests that you should be on, or if you're small, it, it means that you should be off. And whereas the, the, the actual color of the node actually encodes what's your state now. So if you're red, you're actually on. Right? So specifically, if we look at this large dark node, black node, it means that this is a node that should be on, according to the advertisement, but actually is currently off. It's mismatched. The other possible mismatch is to have a small node that should be off, but is on. It's a red one. And every other combination is, is the ones that, you know, they're, they're the well-behaved ones. Okay. And, okay, so going back to our proof, it's like we're trying to capture, to upper bound the total weight of these uncovered sets, okay? Uh, but what is it, why is such a, how can such a set be uncovered? when it was covered in the advertised solution? Well, it must be that some, that we have a mislabeled off node, okay? There was somebody there that was covering the set in the advertisement, but now this, this guy has changed his mind, okay? But in our model, if you're not following the advice, you're best responding, okay? And this is gonna be very helpful in our analysis. So, so if you're best responding, then Let's look at, uh, so currently you pay a cost that is equal to the sum of the, of the weights of these sets, of these uncovered sets that you have created, and you prefer that to being turned on, okay? And being, becoming part of the cover. But this cost is already accounted in the cost of the advertised solution. So as a result, you can upper bound the cost of these new extra uncovered sets by the cost of the advertised solution, okay? And that's lemma one. Uh, unfortunately, like the lemma two is kind of, again, you want to do some sort of like accounting, but now the accounting becomes much trickier, and you have to do a case analysis. So here, the problem is that is with agents that should be off, but they're on, okay? And they, they create this like extra cost. And again, like the, our guiding fact is, is gonna be uh, that all of these agents, again, if, you, if they're not doing what they're supposed to do, according to the advertisement, it means that they're best responding, okay? And now we, we perform some case analysis based on the number of uh, on elements that are actually uh, included by the advertisement in a specific set, okay? The easier case is, uh, is sets like this, where the advertisement had all uh, essentially nodes being off, okay? Then here, uh, essentially, if you're on and you're best responding, it means that 
your cost now is less than the cost of actually of the whole of the weight of the set. But the weight of the set was already accounted in the advertised solution because it was it used to be uncovered. Okay, so the, this this the case is trivially captured. Okay, uh, the problem is with the other two cases, and uh, when you have when the advertised solution assigns more one or more nodes being on, and in this case you have to do some trickier probabilistic analysis, and the the quadratic term happens in this like last case here where these are the cases where you have two or more possible on nodes according to the advertisement but in the actual in the actual solution this set is covered by a third element okay? and in vertex covered games these kind of configurations are impossible because uh, the size of its set is exactly two okay? so this is exactly zero and allows for the tight capturing of, of uh, this behavior in vertex cover games. But for set cover games, this can be, this can be much worse. And again, to, to go a little bit deeper in the intuition of, of how one would to prove such an element, such a statement is that, well, let's think about it, okay? Now, if, since essentially, if you want to upper bound the expectation of these sets, well, in each such set, you have at least one uh, of element, okay? Uh, some guy that, that used to be on and is currently off, okay? So it's a, it's a fast to actually bound this probability. And now, what we, what we do is that like, there, there are two possible sort of like worlds, okay? Here, there's a lot of like independence, right? So an off node, let's like, like, as in for example in, in uh, vertex cover instances, an, an off node that that is part of many edges, uh, the only way that she's actually gonna be on is in, in a very sort of like rare event because all of these like independently random coin tosses must, must flip in the wrong direction, okay? This thing happens in uh, vertex cover games, but in set cover games, you can actually have like a dependent randomness. So even, even if a single like on node participates in many sets, it could be that he has a very small certificate that allows him to be off, okay? And, and this is how the, uh, the quadratic terms like come into play, by this kind of like correlation between the sets. And now, as we said, like we want to prove something stronger. We want to prove a stronger result based on, on a specific uh, advice, uh, on a specific structure of the advice. And the way we'll do this actually, we'll actually uh, change the advice vector so that these two large cases, the, the expected number, these, the actual number of sets that have this kind of properties are zero with high probability. So we're actually going to, by providing like a new advice vector, we'll actually take care of these like bad cases, like magically, right? And how are we going to do this? Like the, remember, the problem was with guys that used to be on, that should be on, but decided to turn off, okay? So we want this to never ever happen. Well, here is a case when this uh, never happens. Well, suppose that you're on, and you're the unique on element in let's say some uh, some relatively large number of sets. Well, in this case, with with high probability, well, there will be at least one guy here that decides to follow the advice, and this guy will force you to stay on. All right. So as long as our advice has this, uh, as long as our advice vector has this specific property that every single on agent has a large certificate of uh, sets in which he is the unique on element, then you're safe. All right. So here I will describe how one can can compute such a such an advice vector of relatively low cost. Like the very first step is to actually find a, a constant approximation to a, like a, an outcome to this game that's a constant approximation to the optimal outcome. Well, this is, uh, again, this like standard approach. We just take a relaxation of, of this uh, offering problem and we perform a, essentially, we, we perform a rounding step that allows us to, to essentially find a, a deterministic uh, an integral sort of like solution to this problem. 
and that does not have that it only blows up the cost by uh, by a constant factor. Okay. So essentially, we set a, a node to be one if and only if the corresponding variable is at least one over this, this constant. Okay. And now what we're going to do is essentially we want to compare this cost with the cost of the optimal solution. But remember now, depending on the W's and the S's, the cost of the optimal solution might not be an actual cover. Okay. So we cannot immediately compare this with this, which we know this, but we know that this term is actually less than all possible like integral covering. So what one can show is that starting from the optimal solution, without essentially like losing a lot, you can actually like derive, uh, you, you, you can actually derive an, an actual covering by forcing each element that's uncovered, you know, to be covered by turning any of its members on, okay? So this costs only another uh, constant multiplicative term, and as a result, you can compute in polynomial time an advice vector that's a constant time approximation to the optimal solution. Now, this is relatively standard. The thing is that we want to do is that we want to make sure that this advice vector has its extra property, okay? Well, in this case, we can do this, we can perform this like, we can make sure of this by performing this like greedy moves. Like finding any such node that has a small certificate, and just take it out of the solution. Remember now, we, we, we know that there are, there are most like C times, there's most like order of log n sets that are being essentially uh, turned off that you have to pay for. So the social cost can only increase by this logarithmic factor away. So without really incurring like a, a huge penalty, we make sure that these bad cases are never going to happen with high probability. Right. And I'll, I'll also give a, a brief description of uh, the of the intuition behind the proof of like between learning and decide. And in some sense, this is a, a again there are like two phases: the exploration and the exploitation phase. And the exploitation phase is where the the problems will actually like new problems will arise. Right. So in this, remember that in the second phase of the PSA model, uh, of the public service advertising model, it was trivial because everybody was best responding, so the potential was always decreasing. Well, here it's not always the case, right? In the second phase, you either best respond or you actually choose to follow the advice. And this can create uh, extra challenges that we need to address. But for, but for the proof of the, of the of essentially upper bounding the cost at the end of the first phase, essentially we have to prove analogs of the first two lemmas, okay? Of the lemmas that we saw in the case of public service advertising. Well, so what was the main idea, essentially, that allowed the proof of the public service advertising to go through? Well, the main idea was that, well, we knew that if somebody did not follow the advice, then he was doing what's best for him, okay? And that, that was very central for the proof. This is not necessarily the case here, because here the agents essentially they behave probabilistically. But so what we do, we go around this by actually defining this following event. So this is like a, an, this is an event that essentially defines a, some sort of like short uh, cyclical play that says that, well, if you wait long enough, then eventually you get a, every off element playing once and then every own element playing once, and then every off element playing once again, okay? Now it's easy to solve with like, using standard like union bound techniques, that if you wait uh, a polynomial amount of like time steps, then this will happen with very high probability. So in terms of like, uh, creating like bounds on the expected size of specific like random variables, uh, you know, we're safe with just assuming that this event always happens, okay? Because the probability of this event not happening will essentially have like a vanishing effect over the expectation of any sort of like random variable. So, but, so why did we go through this uh, like interesting like trick here? Well, this interesting trick actually uh, buys us exactly what we need, okay? <laughs> as, I, as I've told just before is that like the trick uh, 
with the proof of like lemmas one and two, like the intuition behind this is that well, the mistakes are always made by people who are doing best respond. Well, if you're doing best respond, then your mistake cannot really be that severe. Okay, it's not severe for you, and it's not severe for the social cost. Well, now that we have defined this specific ordering of play, essentially we can go through this history, and we can try to identify any sort of like mistake to a specific uh, agent that has like best responded like last. Okay, and this essentially allows us to use techniques of the of the previous two of the of techniques that we used in, in the first version of lemma one and lemma two, and extend them to the learn and then decide model. Um, however, as I said, like here, the real tricky, the, like the new tricky part comes in the in the second phase. And here it's actually like rather like non-trivial what happens is because the agents are not necessarily best responding. But some of them they're just like following the advice, and when you actually perform such a move then you actually could lead to large increases on the, on the potential function. Okay? So again, we want to be able to uh, upper bound the expectation of this difference. Right? Now, what's going to come to our rescue here is that, well, suppose that you actually decide when you commit to commit and always play, let's say, the advertised strategy. Well, this means that you only change your strategy once on, your com on, on that step where you decide to commit. And from this point on, you're done. Okay? So all you have to do is like, we have to check every single agent and we have to consider a single off and on move. Either from turning from off to on or from on to off for every single agent. And we need to make sure that the change of potential along this like single uh, change is is relatively like small. Okay? Does not really destroy all the uh, all the all the positive progress that we've made during like phase one. Now the the easier case is, is the case where we have an off element that actually turns on. Okay? Now remember like this is like uh, and, and why is that the case? Well if you're turning on then that's not too, too, too much of like a, of a hassle because the cost of all of these terms is already captured in the advertised solution. Okay. So, but if they're counting the advertised solution, then you can show that this change in potential is of the same order of magnitude as the cost of the advertised solution, and that suffices for our purposes. Now, the tricky situation is is actually the the other one. And here we won't go much into the, the details of this, but again, we need to perform a, a case analysis. And the case analysis depends on the number of on elements that are assigned by the advertised solution uh, to the sets. Okay? And, and how, how many of them have survived? And essentially, like, stayed on uh, at the end of, of phase one. If none of them have stayed on, then essentially, we have already upper bounded the number of these sets in these first two levels. And whereas if, if you have all nodes that have survived, then you have to be actually rather careful and consider, you know, the what are the possible like randomizing orders in terms of uh, the moves of the agents within the set, and so that the expectation of this, this change of uh, potential is is, uh, is small. So, I mean, yeah. I mean, so this is sort of like, uh, like a high-level idea of, of, where, of how these difficulties like uh, come into play in, uh, in the analysis of these uh, games and these models. And here I'll also like end with some open question. And I think that there's really like a lot of like a lot of like need in terms of exploring these kind of approaches. Like so far, like uh, our models actually have like a very strong characteristic. They actually say that. I have no idea who picks up the advice. Okay, I just broadcast something, and it could be that, you know, this uh, it could be that this message is picked up by a small, let's say, neighborhood of agents, 
and this this could really mess up my analysis. Whereas if I could like let's say, if I could advertise in a targeted way, I could say you know I don't like well, like one guy from this click or one guy from this click, and then I'll be fine, I'll be done. This of course then you would be able to to give much stronger guarantees. And actually this this. Uh, there's quite a lot like, like literature in terms of like empirical analysis of such phenomena, let's say in things like uh, uh, sad instances. And it's, for example, like well known that, you know, even for tricky instances of like, of, of uh, tricky large instances of like sad, of sad problems, then there, there exists this like very like thin set of like variables that if they're set correctly, then this whole like instance becomes immediately trivial, okay? These things are known as like factor variables and it would be very interesting if we can provide a more so like concrete theoretical understanding besides this set. Okay. And of course here, really we're trying to provide a specific model for something that's very generic. That is like how, in how, in, in what way can a centralized like authority somehow provide information to a system and try to direct in a specific uh, in, a, in a, towards a specific trajectory and. I think we're very interesting to see other variants of this kind of idea. And along this line, we have actually have like a recent work where you can have more than one like advice centers. So for example, there are like two companies and like the management of the prospective companies, they, they, you know, they want to provide advice to their agents in a way that they are outcompete the other company, okay? And finally, as I said like uh, at the beginning of, of this talk, like this idea of, of, of what actually constitutes a good advice is something that is a, that's generically an interesting question that sort of like generalizes the question of what's an asset equilibrium. So an asset equilibrium is a state that is stable and actually has effect in the system if everybody is willing to sort of like follow this advice. But here we're asking, okay, what if a very small percentage is actually willing to follow a specific uh, uh, outcome? Does this outcome under, in, in what kind of games does this out, do there exist outcomes such that even in these cases they have a non-trivial effect in the final state of the system? I think this is a very so like interesting, a very practical question that lies on the intersection of like management and computer science, and it's really like quite quite open. So I'll be very excited to talk about these issues and more with you. And thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> your model, your models of advice were these things that were basically introduced to those two papers. That you That's right. Yeah. Questions. Any questions? Which model is more realistic? Well, actually, it really depends on the setting. Like, uh, so, so for example, like you can think that uh, in some settings, like this advert. PC advertising makes a lot of sense. For example, when, when uh, let's say, experimentation does not have like a lot of cost for you. Okay, so you see, you see some advice, and yes, you know, I'm willing to take, to take into consideration. But for example, when you actually have to pay for experimenting, then the exploration versus exploitation, like uh, protocols, are something that are actually used in practice. So they they make they make more sense, and they they also like harder to And so I guess uh, one potential critique of the model is that it doesn't seem that the agents in both these models of the agents' initial choices utility maximizing in any sense, right? Like, well, what do you mean initial choices? Uh, so in some sense, I, I obey with probability alpha, right? Mm -hmm. Like I'm paying attention, I obey with probability alpha, and then in another sense, I just I obey with some probability, and then neither of these things are Maybe rational, can. right? Like. Well, I, I should want to system that if I know that everybody else is acting like this, then my best response should take this into account. Right, but like all this analysis is called regardless of how small the probability is, right? So in any model where you say that, okay, I'm willing to take this, this advice into consideration, but only if it doesn't really mess up, let's say my respective like chains, well, any such model would give you like a, like an upper bound on, on, on how, how, on, how possible is it that you take advice for this information? And all you have to do is like, you know, you have to analyze something with PI less than this bound. So you, you have to incorporate more complicated models by using this as a base case. That's what I'm saying.
Thanks again. Thank you.